fair battle to John, okay? I think Maybe. my task is not so difficult. <laughs> I think I can, can, I can make it in a few seconds. My mother takes warfarin already 15 years. Thank you for attention. <laughs> but the mother-in-law. <laughs> uh, so, but I prepared some slides as well. <laughs> When we discussed uh, who should take this uh, debate against John Cam, nobody was volunteering, so I decided to take this suicide mission. And uh, I was happy to hear from Nathan Bornstein at the previous session his view on uh, Warfarin, because probably he, as a chairman, can help me to save my life in this dispute. <laughs> So these are my potential conflicts of interest, much less than John Kamp. <laughs> and uh, this is a trial which was shown already by John, so I think I can skip some, some of these informations which will be just repeated. But you have seen this, uh, this many times. And uh, what I st stress here is that in this trial there were two populations, and one was population <coughs> where surgery was done during the current hospital stays and the other group was patients longer time after surgery and this may have some impact on the trial results. Uh, and this is the dabigatran dose which was used, so you see <coughs> it's a much higher dose than uh, we use it in, uh, in atrial fibrillation. And these are the results which were disappointing as you have already heard uh, from, from John. So uh, why this, uh, and this is another slide with results of this study, and warfarin did better in this group of patients. Why did Dabigatran fail in this real, realigned trial? Uh, most thromboembolic events in this group occurred in patients who started a drug within seven days after valve surgery with fewer occurring in patients uh, who were longer time after surgery. So uh, excess bleeding events among patients receiving dabigatran occurred in both study populations. Warfarin inhibits the activation of tissue factor coagu induced coagulation, and this was also mentioned by, by John in the previous presentation, and the contact pathway induced coagulation is a little bit different from or quite different from uh, what uh, we see, for instance, in uh, atrial fibrillation without, uh, without uh, these uh, foreign bodies. Data from AF trials, uh, trials cannot be extrapolated to patients with mechanical heart valves because the mechanisms of thrombosis are different. So we have here this trial, uh, which shows that in the most thrombogenic situation, Warfarin is doing better than novel oral, oral anticoagulants. This tells you something about the effectivity of the old poison drug. Uh, this is uh, the slide showing any stroke in the main atrial fibrillation trials. So you see uh, some, uh, some differences favoring uh, novel oral anticoagulants, as was shown. Uh, and this was the warfarin dosage in these trials. Usually uh, the, the goal was uh, to keep INR between two and three. And these are the patient risk profiles in these trials. So only Rocket AF had high risk population and the, others, the other trials here has, let's say, medium risk populations. Uh, uh, pulmonary embolism and myocardial infarction rates in these trials are shown in this slide. And you see that there are no differences between, no significant differences between warfarin and dabigatran with some interesting trends, but the numbers are so small that hardly we can make any conclusions from this. Uh, what about gastrointestinal bleeding? This is, these are the rates of gastrointestinal bleeding in these slides. Do you see in Rely it was more after oral anticoagulants, in Rocket it was more, in Aristotle it was about the same, and in Engage AF it was more. Uh, what was the study drug discontinuation rate in the main uh, atrial fibrillation trials? It was very similar in both groups in all trials, 
but it was quite high, if you see, between 17 and 35 percent. What are the advantages of direct oral anticoagulants? They are stable and have predictable dosage. They have short half-life, quick fading of anticoagulant effect in case of bleeding, no need for laboratory controls, and low risk of fatal bleeding complications, including hemorrhagic stroke. But what are the warfarin advantages over direct oral anticoagulants? A long half-life may be disadvantage for warfarin if you, have, if you face bleeding, but it is an advantage of warfarin when you want to have a stable anticoagulant effect. Because if the patient is, will miss one, two doses, usually nothing dramatic happens, while in, if the patient may, will miss a couple of doses in uh, drugs, he is completely un unprotected. Uh, wide availability, of course, is uh, advantage of warfarin because of low price. Regular laboratory controls may increase the adherence to medication. The patient is forced to go to um, seek medical controls for uh, INR check, and this means that the patient takes care more about taking the pills and seeing some, some healthcare professionals. And better protection in the highest risk situations like prosthetic valves, as I already mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Now, I think that uh, we can open this debate for discussion. I have two points to mention. Uh, for John, I think that one of our problems as the stroccologist is the use of NOAX, DOAX, with acute ischemic stroke, the TPA is considered. So this is one of the points that you have not mentioned as weakness of this drug so far. And another point that I think that I've heard you many times saying that if you have patient on warfarin and the TTR is between two and three more than 70% of the time, had it been like that in the clinical trials, maybe the clinical trials against NOAX wouldn't be as favored as had they been. So what is your comment on this? Well, let us start with the second point, because all the trials with analyses dividing patients into quartiles of time in the therapeutic range with the exception of the RELY trial, all the trials showed it didn't make us any difference to the superiority of the NOAC. Now, in the RELY trial, there was some difference between those who were lower in the therapeutic range, but by, and if you put them all together, it doesn't make a difference in meta-analysis. But I think intuitively, you're, you must be right, but the trials argued against it. Secondly, to come to your first point, I agree. It's a weakness that at the moment we don't know how to deal with people who are anticoagulated who may then require thrombolysis. We have this simple, rather simple rule with warfarin. 1.7 or less you can treat as not anticoagulated. You can go ahead with thrombolysis. We have no equivalent figure with the NOAC drugs. We do know, however, that we can do simple coagulation tests to tell us that there is no substantial NOAC on board, like the uh, APTT or the uh, uh, prothrombin time. We, the, the thrombin time, rather. We can do these tests that will tell us that, but they won't tell us anything if there is any drug on board. We do have chromogenic assays, for example, for the factor 10A inhibitors, but not many places have them. We don't know how to interpret the results of those chromogenic assays. We do have Eckerin tests and such like for dobigotran. Again, we don't know how to interpret it. But that is, I think, a question of time. We will have similar information right now. I must admit, uh, you got me. Yeah. 